revolution will be live. But since she was fired in December, she's turned on President Trump, and now in her new book, she calls the president a racist, a bigot, and a misogynist, and says he is losing his mental faculties. The White House has fired back in a statement, quote, this book is riddled with lies and false accusations. It's sad that a disgruntled former White House employee is trying to profit off these false attacks. And Omarosa has a recording that she says she recently made, uh, that she secretly made of her firing by John Kelly. We've got to talk to you about uh, leaving the White House. Um, it's come to my attention uh, over the uh, last few months that there's been some pretty, in my opinion, significant integrity issues. You're going to hear more of that recording in a moment. So Marosa Manigault Newman, former assistant to President Trump, director of communications for the White House Office of Public Liaison, joins me now. Thank you for having me, Welcome Chuck. To the press. Let me start with um, what you describe in your book as a year-long effort to learn the truth about a rumor that Donald Trump had been caught on tape using the N-word while working on The Apprentice. And here's how you wrote about confirming with a source that the tape does in fact exist. Page 322 of your book. On this phone conversation, I was told exactly what Donald Trump said. Yes, the N-word and others in a classic Trump goes nuclear rant. And when he'd said them, during production, he was mic'd, and there's definitely an audio track. For over a year, I'd been so afraid of hearing the specifics from someone who'd been in the room. Hearing the truth freed me from that fear. Did you hear the tape, or did you hear a description of the tape? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. And in this book, I describe this long journey of hearing these rumors over and over again. And when I had an opportunity to meet up with three different sources, they describe the same exact statements. After I closed the book, I had an opportunity to go out in Los Angeles and sit down with the person who actually has a copy of the tape. And I heard his voice as clear as you and I are sitting so you here. You have heard the tape? I have heard Since the publication tape. of this book? Absolutely. So you know it exists? And I know it exists. Okay. And what I regret is that these people are probably trying to leverage it as this October surprise. And I don't want to be a part of that. But I have heard for two years that it existed, and once I heard it for myself, it was confirmed what I feared the most, that Donald Trump is a con and has been masquerading as someone who is actually open to engaging with diverse communities. But when he talks that way, the way he did on this tape, it confirmed that he is truly a racist. Why didn't you get that in your book? Close too soon, and I have been tracking, tracking. This person is so afraid because of the forces who are working to keep this tape from coming out. I mean, we first heard about it in the fall of 2016, got on a conference call with Katrina Pearson, mm -hmm. Lynn Patton, and Jason Miller, as you'll see in the book, yeah. and they all suspected that it was true. In fact, Katrina Pearson, the spokeswoman for the campaign, said, oh, he said it. It's true. But she never heard her say it, and she heard him say it, and well, she is, she's denied the Is anecdote. she denying? I mean, she knows I have receipts. I think she should probably uh, read the this. book first Had you and then hear herself saying before, it. Before listening to that tape, before getting the tape that mm -hmm. you, you just described, had you ever heard him? Were you ever in his presence when he used a racial slur? You know, I was in his presence when he said inappropriate things, but he has never said the N-word in my presence, ever. All right, let me uh, move on, because you said um, that the betrayal, the idea that he might have used this word, um, that it would be this betrayal because you thought it would men, mean that he might have used it about you. Oh, Do you absolutely. believe he used it about you? Possibly, because Donald Trump talks about everyone behind their backs. You leave the room, Chuck, he has a nickname probably for you. He has a nickname for everyone in his administration and in his circle, so I am pretty certain that he's probably said some very derogatory things about me. In fact, yesterday, on this moment before Charlottesville, the anniversary of Charlottesville, instead of talking about how to unify the nation, he actually insulted me by calling me a lowlife. That is a man who is inclined to tr start racially charged engagement and use race to kind of stir up his base. Here's what I think a lot of people are going to have trouble with. Um, he has said a lot of racial things. He said a lot of racial things during the campaign calling Mexican rapists, attacking a federal judge because he was Hispanic. You even talk about his obsession with the, quote, Central Park Five uh, mythology there, Re retweeting false crime statistic. All of that was taking place. And, and you said you acknowledged that he did things that were racial, um, that he used race to manipulate people. Mm -hmm. You said all those things. And then you wrote this in December of 2016. 
I am living the American dream because of Donald Trump. Look at my career, the wealth and exposure that I've had. It's very difficult to make the argument that Donald Trump doesn't like black people and black women. Absolutely. Um, being used by Donald Trump for so long, I was like the frog in the hot water. You don't know that you're in that situation until it just keeps bubbling and bubbling. It's clear in hindsight, because hindsight, of course, is 2020. But as I talk about in Unhinged, you get to see from 2003, when I first met Donald Trump, the evolution of a very unique relationship between he and I. And I talk very, very intimately about the things that he said, his, his pledge to do more for the community, his, as I said, investment in my own career. But what I know now, I didn't have the benefit of in 2003 or 2004 or 2010. And so yes, it is hindsight. But I will say this to you, I was complicit with this White House deceiving this nation. They continue to deceive this nation by how mentally declined he is, how difficult it is, it is for him to process complex information, how he is not engaged in some of the most important decisions that impacts our country. I was complicit, and for that, I regret. Well, one of those moments of complicity took place after Charlottesville. Oh, yeah. Um, this is the president. Uh, the day uh, after Charlottesville, he condemned the egregious display of hatred, bigotry, and violence on many sides. This is before he said the both sides comment, but on ma he had already used the phrase many sides. Two days later, you were on Fox News defending him. Here's what you yeah. said. President Trump, he said that he condemned the acts. He knew that they were disgusting and loathsome, but he did not come out until the facts were known about the investigation. And today, he made a statement that was very clear and very decisive about where he stood on these acts. What do you think of that, well, Omarosa? Absolutely. I mean, as you said, it was That's before complicit? He started. Was that complicit, Omarosa? Oh, totally Omarosa? complicit. In fact, I had a blind spot where it came to Donald Trump. I wanted to see the best in him. And obviously, I, I felt miserably because after that, he gets up and he says that there are good people on both sides mm -hmm. when he should have been denouncing what we saw as clearly racist, Nazis going against the grain of this country. And it's just really difficult to see that I was so much a part of this. And I accept and I admit that I was. But Why now I think it's important that as we are celebrating, well, actually observing mm -hmm. the anniversary of Charlottesville, that he has an opportunity actually to bring the country together, but you'll see that he doesn't have the ability to do that because he puts himself over country every day. Here's what um, many people are seeing, though, that after Charlottesville, you didn't resign. Um, and yes, you wanted to work on the, uh, I think, Historical Black College Initiative. Which would have been a I understand later, that, yeah. I understand that. But then you didn't leave after that. You didn't leave after he had that um, unfortunate call with the widow of the, of the dead soldier. You didn't leave after he called kneeling NFL players SOBs. Um, and this is what Jelani Cobb uh, uh, wrote in the New Yorker about your new perspective. Mm -hmm. Her realization about Trump's outlook appears to have emerged at some point during her book deal. That's not a gradual awakening. It's a glacial, self-interested one. There's going to be many people here that say, you're now identifying him as a racist after you got his your book deal. What do you say to that criticism? Well, I, first of all, I, I need to push back about that. First of all, I am an author. This is my third book. I write about my life. I write about the things that happen in my life. So the assertion that I just woke up and decided I'm going to write a book when this is my third book, that's, you know, okay. I have to push on that. But certainly, I was working to try to find someone who could take my place. I was the only African American at the table if I left, which I did. When I left, there has been no new appointment of an African-American assistant to the president, which means that people are making decisions about us yeah. without us. And as I worked to try that to find that replacement, I realized that they could care less about having an African-American voice at the table. And to this day, there is no one serving in that administration in the role that I was in. And that's a great void. And so the people who want to judge mm -hmm. should probably read the book first and give me an opportunity to at least examine the journey that I was on before making decisions and judgments about my story I think arguments some it. have made and I've heard it but they, they should would say, read it would say first you know part of the reason that you're there is to stand in front of the racial freight train and that you didn't you didn't do that that you and you've admitted that you were complicit. I describe myself as a guardrail <laughs> in the book I'm not were you it's a good guardrail oh I got banged up a lot mm -hmm. I got banged up by people who thought that there should be no African Americans in this administration and they're seeing the result of having absolutely no voice that it is impacting the policies that affect our children inner cities policies that inform 
all the things that are happening in regards to crime, particularly in Chicago as we see the death, without a voice there, you're going to continue to see them neglect the needs of a community that really does need leadership right now. All right, I'm going to go to your White House time, and we'll start Please. Uh, on your last day. Um, were you fired or did you resign? What's the oh, story? What, 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 what do we call this? It's pretty clear from that recording that John Kelly came in and said, this is the end, we want you to leave. But what's interesting is they take me into the situation room, the doors are locked, they tell me I can't leave, and they start to threaten me, put fear in me, to put me under duress. Look, I'm gonna play, I wanna play this tape, but I'm curious, how is it you recorded the chief of staff. Absolutely. The White House chief of staff yes. in the Situation Room. Yes. And you're, this, this takes place before the Christmas party. In the party, Situation Room. And you're prepared in a moment's notice to record him? Or were you planning to record him the minute you found out you had this meeting? Well, no. First of all, like I said, I'm the only African American there. When you walk into a meeting with John Kelly, who's refused to meet with me the whole time he's there, in the Situation Room, Chuck, mm -hmm. we're not going in there to talk about, you know, parking or scheduling you, issues. You knew this was going to We're going in there job. to talk about something very you serious. You prepared to tape. I was prepared because, first of all, John Kelly had been very vocal about trying to find a reason to let me go. He had gone to the press instead of coming to me, never given me an opportunity to meet with him. So the question is, why not have the meeting in the Chief of Staff's office? Why put me in the Situation Room, lock the door, and tell me over and over again, as they'll hear, well, they'll hear his yes. part, that I couldn't leave, that I couldn't consult an attorney, that I couldn't talk to my husband who was sitting outside of the door. Yes, I was prepared. And as you'll see in how Unhinged... How often did you tape people? Wait, Chuck. I know. As you'll how see often in you Unhinged, people? I protected myself because this is a White House where everybody lies. The president lies to the American people. Sarah Huckabee stands in front of the country and lies every single day. You have to have your own back because otherwise you'll look back and you'll see 17 you know knives in your back. It looks though, That's that not disloyalty. That's not disloyalty because let me tell you, Chuck, if I did not have this recording, yeah. people would still believe the false, incredible story that I was running around the White House, the false story that was told by a reporter and repeated by this network and other reporters that I tried to charge right. the residents of the White House, and it's a lie. If I didn't have this recording, listen, yep. people would still think that I was trying to set off alarms. So yes, I had to protect myself and I have no regret about it. Let's listen to the recording. I think it's important to understand that if we make this a friendly departure, um, we can all be, you know, you can look at, look at your time here in, in the, the White House as a year of service to the nation, uh, and then you can go on without any type of uh, difficulty in the future relative to your reputation. How did you take that comment about your reputation? It's very obvious, a threat. He's, he goes on to say that things can get ugly for you. The Chief of Staff of the United States, under the direction of the President of the United States, threatening me on damage to my reputation and things getting ugly for me. That's downright criminal. And if I didn't have these recordings, no one in America would believe me. No one. So I protected myself, and I'm going to tell you, I'm so glad I did. Because now we can put to bed all those false rumors that that one reporter stated and the false reporter, re reports that were spread around by the media. All right, let me play... Um the portion where you jump in and have a conversation with Mr. Please. Can I you ask you a couple of questions? Uh, Does the president, is the president aware of what's uh, going on? Don't, let's not go down the road. This is a non-negotiable discussion. I don't want to uh, negotiate. I just, I've never talked, had a chance to talk to you, General Kelly. Yeah, so if this is my departure, I'd like to have at least an opportunity no, uh, to understand. We can, we can talk another time. This has to do with some pretty serious viola integrity violations. Um, so I'll let it go with that. So uh, the, the staff and everyone on the staff works for me, not the president. You've made no bones about that you have a lot of tapes. Um, but he just said the staff and everybody works for him, not the president. Right. You don't have a problem with that, Chuck? There's many the White staff, Houses, for what it's worth, many White Houses are organized that way where the chief of staff is the lead. It tells you that Donald lead. Trump has no idea what's happening in the White House. He has no clue. Are you no convinced clue. he did not know that minute that you No, I know he knows okay. because I've talked to him subsequently. And he said he delegated. I delegated. Mm -hmm. So he knew. He knew that John Kelly was going to take me into the Situation Room and lock me in there, threaten me, and say that things were going to get ugly for me and there would be damage to my reputation. And you know what? The next day there was damage to my reputation right. because they then put out a story using and exploiting an African-American reporter to say that I was running around the residence and trying to break into a Christmas party, which is ludicrous, Chuck. And it's unacceptable. And that's the way these folks operate. When he said that people answer to him and not the president, 
president. That should be concerning for every single American that hears that. Let me ask you about the integrity issues that he brought up. Please. If you gave, if the White House asked for permission to release your file, I would love for them to do. I'm saying this You're right, saying right here. now. The I'll meet release, the press. Release the HR file of whatever violations. Please, please, Make let's it bring it record. all to light. I'm saying right here on Meet the Press. Okay. They accused me. You took a car to the national baseball game. So the White House control. today released. Release You're okaying it. them every Absolutely. single tr uh, transgression that General Kelly Absolutely. was referring to there. Because at the same breath, in the same breath, Rob Porter is accused of allegedly mm -hmm. abusing his wives. And you know what John Kelly said about Rob Porter? He said he was a man of great integrity. And he's accusing me of integrity violations. Please, I'm saying it right now. Release it so that the American people can see that I worked my butt off to make a difference in this country and they were looking for ways to frame me and then they tried to buy off my silence which is also unlawful all right I want to get to get to that in a second but the Daily Beast uh, in September of 17 when you're saying people were Chuck, trying are we to really I want the Daily Beast I want I want to ask I want to ask you this <laughs> it says here that you were called the most despised person in the White House that you would hijack White House meetings that you would distract President Trump with negative news coverage could those be the reasons why John Kelly chose to fire you? Well, at least they didn't call me the coffee girl. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's an upgrade to their usual go-to uh, excuses that they make when they mistreat people. People despise that I was close to this president, that I had access to him, that I talked to him often, and that I influenced his policy making. I will admit to you, Chuck, there were times that Donald Trump asked me to do things that were just downright bizarre. He would say, go and pull up this article about, for instance, Joe Scarborough and Mika. I want to know about this and that. I wondered, of course, why he asked me. It wasn't his press secretary, but it was because he was working around the people who would put these guards in. You and were I, the one, you were and the I one confide. giving him the negative coverage. I was giving him whatever the, what he when the president see. calls you and says, get this and that for me, right. I did it. Yes, I was one of the people feeding him the things that he asked for because he is the president of the United States. When he calls and asks, you answer. All right, you talked about that you were offered a job on the campaign. You have shown me the email, the offer. I have read the offer. Um, that you received from Laura Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't from Laura Trump. It was emailed to from, me from the from, campaign. From the campaign. Yes. Um, and I want to put up the non-disclosure agreement here. It is a very stringent one. It said this, the no disparagement clause during the term of your service and at all times thereafter, you hereby promise and agree not to demean or disparage publicly in any form or through any medium the campaign, Mr. Trump, Mr. Pence, any Trump or Pence <laughs> company, any Trump or Pence family member, any Trump or Pence family member company or an asset, any of the foregoing on. And by the way, to avoid any doubt at the bottom of the graph, you agree that this shall survive the termination of this agreement pursuant to paragraph 10. Did, they offer, did you think they were offering you a real job in the campaign, or did they want you to sign this agreement? They were not offering a real job. They told me I could work from home if I even wanted to work. They didn't really care if I showed up. In fact, there are several uh, former employees from the White House who actually signed this agreement, who are all being paid $15,000 for their silence. The only reason unhinged you believe, is... You believe all these people that are on the campaign are being that left the West Wing of the campaign are being bought off. Absolutely, the campaign, the RNC, and America First, which is why Sean Spicer was describing Donald Trump as a unicorn jumping over rainbows because he signed this same agreement. All right, final question for you here. Please. I know we're gonna have some. <laughs> Before The Apprentice, you wrote that you read The Art of the Deal and your plan was to mirror his behavior. Yes. Here's one of the things he wrote in that book. He said, the final key to the way I promote is bravado. I call it truthful hyperbole. It's an innocent form of exaggeration and very effective form of promotion. Anywhere in this book, when you have the Michael Cohen chewing, or Donald Trump chewing up a piece of paper, any of this stuff that we should look at is truthful hyperbole? Truthful hyperbole, no. I have documentation, a whole treasure trove of documentation for everything that you see in this book. And people should be asking, what did Donald Trump and Michael Cohen discuss in that Oval, Oval Office meeting to make him so irritated to rip up the paper that was in front of him and then put it in his mouth? That's the question the American people should be asking. What went down in the Oval Office? All right. What do you want people to take away from this book? I need people to understand my journey. I talk about growing up in the projects. I talk about my father being murdered. I talk about my mother, my beautiful mother, who allowed me to go on and get educated and live an incredible life. This story isn't a story that you would hear if, in fact, I subdued to those threats and signed that agreement. This is a story that you have to hear because it is the embodiment of the American dream. Do you regret auditioning for The Apprentice? No, I don't. It changed my life. I wouldn't have gotten the chance to get to know you and many of the other people in my life. So I don't regret that at all. 
Amoroso Manigault Newman, it's not easy to put yourself out there. You're going to get a lot of arrows. Mm -hmm. um, good luck with your book tour. Thanks for coming on Meet the Press. Thanks for having me, Chuck. The revolution.